Here we are. Now you see me. I'm testing with different um, ways to record videos. And I think it's good for you to see my face here and there. And in this chapter, uh, I will be talking about the English madrigal. Um, the first thing I want you to know is that in the Renaissance, the uh, music basically becomes a social experience, and that's a game changer. Um, I already mentioned the fact that we started to have more people interested in music and choirs forming and more opportunities for job and all those things. And here you see a painting in your screen um, of people singing and with music books, which shows the, the advancement of the printing press. And now you can have uh, music books. And these people are together making music. We also see that uh, women participate uh, in music. In the music, they were actually encouraged. It was part of their education to participate in uh, music making and learning instruments and learning how to sing and things like that. So let's talk a little bit more, more specifically about uh, the madrigal. So the madrigal is, let's see if I can move this here a little bit out of our way. Uh, the madrigal is basically a secular vocal composition uh, for three to eight voices. And I want you to know this items here is it's an aristocratic form, meaning it was uh, it was originated in the courts with um, among the nobility, among the aristocracy, people who were uh, noble people or the people who are friends of this and family of this noble people, the aristocracy. And it's basically the um, when we when we unite poetry in music, and that's what they would do in in those madrigals. It flourished more specifically at Italian courts and then spread to England, and it became the favorite diversion of cultivated amateurs. Uh, so as far as the text, they will use short poems, as you see there, lyric or reflective character. And uh, the word painting is very common. So word painting, if you remember, is basically when the music directly reflects the meaning of the word. So if someone would be singing about heaven, for example, maybe the pitches will be really high, like when I am hanging up in heaven, something like that. Um, but sometimes if they will be singing about hell, then they use low pitches. And so it, it varies a lot. There's different ways. It's not only related to, to different pitches. I could uh, use texture to represent what's going on in the text. If, for example, uh, the, the text of my song, it's about a, a big gathering of people. So they will use a lot of voices at the same time. And if maybe the text would be about chaos and confusion, maybe they will kind of set up the voices all over the place, something like that. So uh, it, there are lots of ways to do that. And in the example that we have in this chapter, we will actually um, hear one example of word painting that is very clear in the madrigal. So moving on, let's try to change my PowerPoint here. There we go. Um, about the development of the madrigal, really quick, it started as a form to give pleasure to amateur performers. You know, maybe people who are not professionals, but they were interested in singing as it became the social experience. But as time went by, the madrigal uh, grew in complexity. So it expanded uh, to usually five or even six voices, so even beyond the regular soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So here we see a form that started to become very elaborate. Claudio Monteverdi is our uh, influential composer in this genre, and he's a representative actually that lived uh, during the Renaissance, but he also links us into the Baroque. Uh, we will continue to hear his name as we study next eras um, 
which is the Baroque era, and especially in the beginning, as we talk about the opera, see how he was influential in that genre as well. But back to the genre of the madrigal. Here I have an example of a madrigal for you. So let me play for you. You will open in a different window, so hang on in there. Adjust the volume. So here you can see we have one, two, three, four, five voices in this particular madrigal. And sometimes some voices pull out, like this represents that their rest. So these two voices are not singing. Right now we just have three voices singing. Now you hear a fuller harmony. For a moment, all voices are there. Four of them are there. This is pull out. If you think in terms of texture, you will notice that sometimes this particular uh, madrigal is homophonic and sometimes it is polyphonic uh, and that's pretty much what usually happens sometimes even monophonic in a few parts if a particular voice would be singing by itself so uh, there is a lot of variety in the texture of this madrigals and that's something i want you to take notes as well so um, actually, let me just point it out a few more things here as we move on. So the madrigal basically originated in Italy. And the example that I just show you is an example of an Italian madrigal, which tended to be very uh, expressive and serious in a way, very dramatic. That's the key as well. Uh, so for example, this example is about cruel amarillis, cruda amarilli. Um, who with your name to love, alas, bitterly you teach. Amarilli is more than the white privet, pure and more beautiful, but deafer than the ass, and fiercer and more elusive. Since telling I offended you, I shall, I shall die in silence. So clearly this person is in love, but he, there's also a tone of resentment here because he's probably not reciprocated. And um, there is a, uh, a certain under layer here of uh, bad feelings about, right? And we can all identify with that if you ever had feelings that were not reciprocate and there's that combination of um, uh, love and hate at the same time, you wanna get rid of that, but you cannot. So the tone, it's, it's pretty calm though in the music. Um, however, you do sense a little bit of that drama. Just wanted to point that, that out. And you can go back and hear it uh, on YouTube if, you, if you'd like. That's what I got that example from. But now we're going to move into uh, talking about the magical in England. Eventually, those books by Monteverdi made their all the way up to England and there were uh, published books and someone took it to England, some English composers took a hold of it and they liked the idea. However, they thought the Italians were a little bit too dramatic. So they created uh, an example of a madrigal that's a little lighter. So the madrigal in, in England tends to be lighter in style with texts that are a little less uh, dramatic as well. And one particular thing that I want to point it out is that uh, it contains usually refrain syllables uh, with fa la la. So when you hear the the tune, the Christmas tune, back the hall, so na 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 na, fa la 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 la, and um, you probably are familiar with that tune, right? 
So this concept of adding this falala came from around this time. So whenever you hear falala in the music and some pop artists sometimes do that, uh, sometimes tralala, something like that, that's actually originated in this uh, English madrigals. Uh, John Farmer is our example of composer here. Uh, he was a composer. He was active in Dublin, Ireland, and then eventually moved to London. And he is the composer of Fair Phyllis. So Fair Phyllis is this fun madrigal that I want you to listen to. And um, there will be some questions about that madrigal. So make sure you do the next activity. And um, there will be some questions about the texture as well as examples of word painting. So as you listen, you'll be figuring out uh, some word painting examples in that particular tune. So go ahead and do that activity. I'll see you next time.